Well, welcome again, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Mike Shanahan, the Planetarium Director at Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey. And this is, in fact, our 17th presentation of original content for our Planetarium Online program. Uh, we're going to be talking about the planet Mars. The show is called All About Mars. So normally, we are doing programming at Liberty Science Center, the Jennifer Chelsea Planetarium, which is the largest planetarium in the entire Western Hemisphere, in all the Americas, 90 feet in diameter. And Digistar, the software that we use in our giant dome to bring the universe to life, we're also now allowed to use it. We are allowed to use it online to bring the planetarium to your living room, your apartments, and so forth. Evans and Sutherland, who makes Digistar, has been very generous in letting us use the software to take astronomy right into your houses for the time that we're closed. We are closed uh, currently when things do get back to semi-normal and things reopen. Come by and see us. We're right across from Manhattan, right across the Hudson in Liberty State Park. Liberty Science Center, in fact, is named for the Statue of Liberty. Now, joining me today is the other planetarium staffer on our team right now. Andrew will be in the chat and answering the questions that you have in the chat about astronomy, about Mars and other topics in astronomy. The show will last about a half an hour. At the end, we'll try to leave time at the end for your questions as, as well. We do get fantastic turnout for our programming. So if we can't get to everyone's questions, please understand that uh, we do get many, many, uh, like a thousand or so folks joining us, but we will try to get to as many questions as we can in the course of our program. And then finally, before we get rolling with our show, we are a nonprofit, like so many nonprofits in many fields. We're trying to carry on our mission during these challenging times. If you would like to support Liberty Science Center, the donate button is the best way to make a contribution to LSC as we try to keep on bringing astronomy to people across the U.S. and across the world. That being said, we're going to begin our show by heading out and looking at where astronomy has its origins. We're going to actually look at the sky that you'd see tomorrow morning at just about 2 o'clock. So it is Friday the 17th here in our view, 2 o'clock in the morning. We're looking towards the south. And in the morning sky, if you're a late goer to better or an early riser, here is the sky you'd see tomorrow morning at 2 in the morning. And over here we have the constellation called Sagittarius. Now Sagittarius, although he is in fact a centaur, he's sort of two in one. He's also an archer. And Sagittarius actually means the archer. It comes from Sagitta, the, the uh, Latin word for, for arrow. But you may more effectively see him, as many have, as a teapot. But whatever you call Sagittarius, it is a constellation that's been with us for a long time. I think the teapot name goes back 200 years, and the term Sagittarius goes back thousands of years. We are still using these names that were invented hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, because the planets move, but the stars don't. The stars stay in the same patterns, and so you won't find this star heading out this way tomorrow or this star going that way. But against the background of these fixed stars, that's where the term came from, the fixed stars, the planets do change their position. The stars come back at the same time every year. So the view you see here in July of 2020, you'll see the same stars next year and 100 years down the road. But not the planets. The planets do shift their position against the starry background. They're closer to us than the stars are, and we can tell their motion in just a few days. It's very similar to the comet. Really, anything in the solar system, be it a comet or an asteroid or a planet, you can see it change its position as time goes by. So here is a view that we have tomorrow morning, three planets visible without a telescope in the morning sky. We have the planet uh, Jupiter as the brightest dot, but next to Jupiter, we have the planet Saturn, no slouch itself, shining at zero magnitude, all summer long, Saturn will be to the left of Jupiter. But Jupiter is blazing away. Jupiter is at minus 2.75 magnitude, which in astronomical terms means it's really, really bright. In fact, Jupiter was in opposition two nights ago when a 
outer planet is in opposition, it means there's a straight line between the sun, the earth, and the planet. And it means that the planet is shining more brightly now than it does at any other time. So the blazing dot of Jupiter and the still vivid bright dot of Saturn. And then joining that and getting brighter by the night is the star of our show, even though it's a planet. The planet Mars is already up and nicely placed in the evening sky and is going to rise around midnight and be pretty well up by the time we get to 2 o'clock. Now, right now, Mars is nowhere near as bright as Jupiter. It is only at uh, minus 0 0.8 magnitude, six times dimmer than the planet Jupiter. But things are going to change, and if we go from the sky tomorrow morning to the sky you'd see in mid-November, then the planet Mars will look quite different. So here we are now in mid-November, November 14. The planet, the famous constellation of Orion is there blazing away in the November sky. And if you cast around to try to find Mars, you can tell it's gotten dramatically brighter. In fact, it swelled up in brightness almost to the same brightness as Jupiter, minus 2.62. So within uh, a hair's breadth of being as bright as Jupiter was back during its opposition. So Mars, between uh, the sky you'd see tomorrow and the sky you see here in mid-November, Mars is going to grow in brightness six times and being a blazing beacon in the nighttime sky. So more about that in a moment. So maybe because of the fact that Mars has kind of a ready reddish color that reminded some folks of blood or of fire. Long ago, Mars was identified with the god of war and with warfare in general. So Mars was referred to as Ares, A-R-E-S, by the Greeks. And in Greek culture, he was often quite the little buffoon. Uh, it, there's a lot of stories about him getting into embarrassing, awkward situations. But to the Romans, Mars was a pretty big deal. He was their most important god. Perhaps not surprising for a, such a martial people. The Romans made a big deal out of Mars. Now here's a statue of Mars. When things get back to normal, I hope you can all get to the Roman Forum someday and visit the Capitoline Museums right beside the Forum. Here's an amazing statue of Mars from those museums. So Mars being the war god, and the Romans being a martial people. Not surprising, they made him into a pretty significant figure in their culture. And in fact, he was supposed to be the father of Romulus and Ramus, the legendary founders of Rome. And he was a big enough deal that they named the first month of the Roman year. It was originally named after Mars. So we still call that month Mars, in our, in, even in English. And if you know that the Roman year used to begin with March, then you can understand why the last three months of the year are called November, October, December. October, November, December. That means eight month, nine month, ten month, which only makes sense if you begin your year in March, uh, not in January. Also, the second day of the week was named after Mars, and that connection is still seen in many Romance languages, so uh, Martes in Spanish, Marta in Italian, and Marty in French all reflect the fact that the, what we call Tuesday in English was named for the god Mars. So a pretty big deal and also gave us words like martial, not to be confused with marital, in our language. And that connection has never really gone away, the idea that Mars equals aggression and warfare. So you see that also as we go into the, uh, for example, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the idea of Mars as a symbol of aggression and warfare. So uh, I was uh, the other day watching uh, a more, one of the rarer Shakespeare plays called Henry VI Part One, which is about the War of the Roses. And as Charles, the King of France, talks about a recent victory against the English, he says that Mars in the sky, as here on Earth, its appearance and motion is unpredictable. He's saying that Mars is hard to predict in the sky in terms of its appearance, just as our fortunes in war are impossible to predict. So Mars, meaning warfare and aggressive aggression, continues all the way down through the Renaissance to modern times. 
Now, one of the things I'm sure that baffled Charles of France about Mars was the unpredictability of its brightness. No other planet varies in brightness in the same way that Mars does. And to explain that, let's uh, use uh, a more solar system-wide perspective. So first of all, you gotta realize that Mars is a really small planet, half the size of Earth. It's only about 4,000 miles in diameter. So it doesn't reflect light all that well. So back in November of last year, Mars was 2.48 AU. Now AU is just, it means astronomical unit, the average distance from the Earth to the sun, 93 million miles. Just a convenient yardstick when you're talking about large solar system distances. So back uh, in November of 2019, the planet Mars was about 232 million miles away. And again, being a small planet, it's not a great reflector of light. So it appeared very dim, third magnitude, uh, when you tried to catch Mars. Now Earth, on the inner path going around the sun, will eventually catch up with Mars as we go into the year 2020, that most Mars-like of years that we're in. And so as time goes on, Mars gets brighter and brighter as the Earth draws nearer to Mars until we get into the fall of this year, fall of 2020, when the distance is reduced dramatically. So instead of being 2.48 AU away, as it was in November of 2019, now Mars is only 0.46 AU away, or about 40 million miles. So that's quite a change from being 232 million miles away in November of last year to this coming fall, when Mars will be just about 40 million miles away. So it flares up dramatically in brightness, and that's why we wind up with around minus 2.6 magnitude Mars blazing away as we'll have it in October and November. So no other planet has that geometry or that great flare in brightness that Mars has. So Mars is not the easiest planet to love and not the easiest planet to study. It's so small, and in a telescope, you often just see a few markings, but mainly you see a fuzzy little red blur. Galileo, with his telescope, discovered the, uh, the, all the moons of Jupiter, the four big Galilean satellites, and mountains and valleys on the moon, and discovered that Venus had phases. But when he observed Mars in September 1610, all he saw was a little fuzzy ball and couldn't make any sense out of it. So. One thing about Galileo was that he made his own telescopes. And when being a telescope maker became a regular job you could do, then dramatically telescopes got better in the middle of the 17th century. So by about uh, around the time of 1659, 1660, telescopes got good enough to reveal some of Mars's secrets. So here's Christian Huygens, and he was the first person to sketch a feature on Mars, his great plane is called Sirtis Major. It is still clearly visible in globes of Mars. And by getting to see a feature on Mars in his telescope, he could also estimate how long a day was on Mars. And interestingly enough, a day on Mars is very close to a day on Earth. A day on Mars is 24 hours and 37 minutes, so only 37 minutes longer than an earthly day. So. Gradually, with these improved telescopes and these great astronomers of the mid to late 17th century, we were getting more of a handle on this planet. But it still remains a little tiny planet that we're observing through the very, very dense atmosphere of our own Earth. And it's hard to, even though they, uh, the, the camera came along and taking photographs through a telescope became a thing, it was still difficult to get a good view of Mars, because often as you're live at the telescope, in these little brief moments when the air gets still, you can still see more detail than you can using photography, as long as you're stuck here at the bottom of a very thick air, uh, ocean of air. So someone who is very much taken with observing Mars live and trying to sketch it to get the detail was someone we discussed about Pluto last week. Again, this is Percival Lowell from Boston, a very well-off family in Boston. Lowell, Massachusetts is named after him. 
And he was a man of great passions. He got, became taken with the uh, Far East, did travels in Japan back when that was not a thing you could do at a drop of a hat from Boston, Massachusetts. And then in uh, 1893, someone gave him a Christmas present, a book by Camille Flammarion, a French astronomer, that was called The Planet Mars. And Lowell became, from that point onwards to the day he died, obsessed with the planet Mars. Within six months of that Christmas present, in Christmas season 1893, he had built this observatory at Flagstaff in Arizona Territory and had begun the process of observing Mars and trying to sketch what he saw through the telescopic eyepiece. And then he wound up writing actually three books about his discoveries about Mars. And as he was sitting there at the eyepiece, waiting for the moments of Claire Singh, and then sketching away, he saw a very different Mars than many folks saw. In fact, Lowell saw over 400 canals on Mars. And he didn't mince words. He believed that these canals were built by highly advanced Martians. He believed that Mars was drying up. That's why the planet had kind of a sandy color to it that the water that was left was in the polar caps, and he believed that Martians had built the canals to bring water from the polar caps to the equatorial cities of Mars. Now, one more note about this is that Lowell believed that the Martians had to be a peaceful people. And his thinking was that these canals were straight lines. They didn't seem to go around any national boundaries. So clearly, Mars had no nations anymore. They had all banded together as one unified planet to get water from the polar caps to the great cities. On the other hand, if you think about Mars meaning aggression for thousands of years and the idea of Mars drying up and water-hungry Martians, it's not a great leap from this view of Mars to the idea of Martians coming and wanting to get our water. And that is the idea behind the famous novel War of the Worlds, which came out two years after Lowell's first book about Mars was published. We don't actually know if H.G. Wells, who wrote this novel, knew about Lowell's work, but he definitely knew about theories by Flammarion about Mars having canals and Mars being inhabited. So in the original version of War of the Worlds, the Martians land outside of London, and they use their three-legged war machines to take over England. They have not lasers, because lasers weren't invented yet, but they have heat rays that blast away and stop the, the armies that are thrown against the monsters. And it seems hopeless. It seems like nothing is going to save the human race from the Martians. And then the Martians are killed by germs. They had not been exposed to germs here on Earth, and that is what stops them when nothing that we throw at them was able to stop the Martians. So a very compelling story and one of the first stories about invaders from another planet and was published in serial form, like it, as a series of sequences in, the, in, the, in a magazine in 1897 and then published as a novel in 1898 and had a very, very interesting impact on science fiction. It was one of the really first science fiction novels to really get the idea of Martian invaders going. So that is 1898, that War of the Worlds is published by H.G. Wells. Fast forward 40 years exactly to 1938, and a whole different man named Wells, no relation. Uh, his name was Orson Wells, and he was working. He was an actor and playwright and got involved in doing radio drama. Orson Wells worked for the Mercury Theater, and they decided to put their theater on the air, which is what still happens. If you tune in tonight to our local uh, public radio station, you can hear Shakespeare's Richard II being done by the public theater on the air. But what they did with the uh, Mercury Theater on the air in 1938 was to take famous novels like Huck Finn and Dracula and dramatize it in a one-hour program that happened at 8 o'clock on Sunday evenings, East Coast time, 5 o'clock Pacific time. Like almost all radio, it was done live. The idea of recorded radio broadcast didn't exist really in the, in the 30s yet. So they decided after all the success they had with Huck Finn and Dracula and other dra uh, dramatizations to take this dusty old novel from 40 years earlier called War of the Worlds 
And they were really, really, really concerned about how to bring it to life. And they had this genius idea, Orson Welles and his scriptwriter, Howard Koch, they decided, what if we did this story as a series of radio news flashes, as if Martians were actually invading the United States? And so they did it that way. They had the Martians land in Grover Mill, New Jersey. And then in a series of news broadcasts, the Martians defeat the local army and then spread out and take over New York City. Now, six million people heard this broadcast live. It's been estimated that up to a million actually believed it was happening. There's some back and forth about how many folks took it seriously, but it did actually cause a panic. It is known as the night that panicked America. At that time, we didn't have like Saturday Night Live or other kinds of imitation news on radio. We didn't even have television yet. And being so close to all the terrible news coming from Europe as World War II was heating up, folks were quick to believe that they were invaded by Martians that night. So one story I hear a lot, and I have never found it to be disproven, was that in Grover Mill, some people who heard the radio broadcast grabbed their shotguns and decided to go hunting for the three-legged war machines that they had heard about on the radio. They thought they saw one, fired away, and destroyed their town's water tower. That indeed is the power of Mars on our imagination. We couldn't really imagine folks panicking like that if Orson Welles had talked about invaders from Venus. Now, this could have gotten Orson Welles in a huge amount of trouble because of the panic. And in fact, in Ecuador, uh, some years later, a repeat of this broadcast led to a riot where folks were so angry at being faked out that they actually stormed the radio station and 12 people were killed. It could have ended very badly for Mr. Wells. Instead, it made him famous and he got a deal with the movies and uh, three years later made what many regard as the best American film ever made, Citizen Kane. His scriptwriter for War of the Worlds, Howard Koch, would be one of the many writers of another classic American film, Casablanca. So for them, it worked out. Anyway, it also opened the doors to even more thinking about what Mars would be like and creating science fiction views of Mars. But to understand what Mars is like, you do have to kind of go there. So we're gonna now look at Mars as we know Mars to be. And right away, as you see Mars, it's pretty obvious that there are no canals. The canals, in fact, were just optical illusions when your mind tries to make sense out of very distant objects, you may think you see lines that aren't really there. The canals themselves were just an optical illusion. They never existed. There never were highly advanced, water-desperate Martians. Mars, by the way, does have two small moons, Phobos and Deimos. These are almost certainly captured asteroids. And as we were saying recently in our asteroid show, they gave us a way to see what asteroids were like in 1971 when the first mi orbiting mission went to Mars because there are these two moons that happen to be captured asteroids. Mars does have polar caps. That's another great similarity between Mars and us. And the polar caps do seem to change with the changing seasons. One of the many ways that Mars is quite Earth-like, although there's more carbon dioxide or dry ice than those polar caps. Mars does have a very thin atmosphere, a hundred times as thin, but there's enough atmosphere for dust storms to blow up. And in fact, sometimes with the change of the seasons, as it warms up in certain parts of Mars, these dust storms can envelop the entire planet. So the last great approach of Mars was just two years ago in the summer of uh, 2018, and it was quite exasperating for us at Liberty Science Center because Mars was entirely blocked from view by the dust storms that came up that summer. So most of the time though, Mars is clear. Again, the air is thin. And what air we have is carbon dioxide. So good for plants, but we animals need oxygen as well. It's also really cold. You may know the Elton John song that says, Mar Mars ain't the kind of place to raise your kids. In fact, it's cold as uh, heck. So 100 degrees below zero is a good average temperature for Mars, much colder than any place on Earth except for maybe extreme uh, conditions in Antarctica. 
planet again has a day like ours, and a little world, uh, again half the size of Earth, <clears throat> although it has amazing features. So in this view here, we can see two of the most famous features of Mars, features that'll definitely be a stop for Martian tourists as we head uh, towards finally getting humans to Mars in the next hundred years or so. Here we have giant, giant mountains. Uh, Mount Olympus over here, 13 miles tall, an extinct volcano, and the Tharsis mountain range, also extinct volcanoes in the 10 mile high range. So higher mountains than anything found on Earth. Evidence of a much more lively Mars geologically in the past than we have now. Another example of that is this giant earthquake crack called the Valley of the Mariners, named for Mariner 9, that first spacecraft to orbit Mars in 1971. So little world with giant amazing features, although Mars' geology has really slowed down. There's not a lot of activity anymore. It had a way, way livelier youth than its current conditions. So Mars again, it, often not clear that Mars is small, but if we compare the size of Mars to the size of Earth, it'll be pretty clear. Uh, and it's also pretty clear in this comparison that uh, Mars is very dry looking compared to our water planet. Planet Mars uh, kind of halfway in size between the moon and the Earth. Low gravity, if you weighed 100 pounds on Earth, you'd weigh 38 pounds on the planet Mars. And in fact, Mars only has about 11% of the mass of our home, home planet. Also, Mars is tilted almost the same way that Earth is tilted. Mars is tilted 25 degrees to our 23 and a half degrees. So it means basically that Mars and Earth have seasons, although the seasons on Mars are longer because of the fact that they have a longer year. Now, we've sent many, many missions to the planet Mars. One of the most well-known ones was Curiosity, which landed uh, in 2012 on August 6th of that year. Curiosity went to Gale Crater and found great amount of evidence that water flooded the planet Mars in the old days, that it used to be a very wet planet billions of years ago, and found evidence that Mars at least has the building blocks of life, like organic molecules, although it didn't find evidence that life had begun in the older, wetter days of Mars. Now, the most recent mission to Mars is called InSight. It landed on Mars just a couple of years ago. It's a geology mission aimed at listening for Mars quakes. And it has been able to find evidence that there are still quakes on Mars. Again, the, in the past on Mars, things were far more lively with erupting volcanoes and giant quakes on Mars. But even now, InSight here is catching evidence that there are still quakes on Mars. The mole here, this burrowing device, they're having some problems with right now. This is a, still a functional mission and they're trying to get it into the soil. It's really hard, rocky soil right now, but they have been able to get signs of quakes on Mars established, and it's been able to analyze also the, the feeble magnetic field and how it changes on Mars. InSight, by the way, was not mainly a visual mission, but being a recent mission with high-def cameras, it has sent back beautiful pictures of what Mars looks like. So here's a real picture of Mars from the InSight mission from the day that it landed. And one point here is that even the sky above Mars is colored pink by all the very fine Martian sand or dust suspended in the atmosphere. The sand on Mars is very fine without a lot of other activity on Mars like water anymore. The sand on Mars gets ground down finer and finer and finer. It's one reason why those dust storms are uh, easy to stir up when the wind begins to blow on Mars. And that brings us up to July of 2020, which is a pretty big month for Mars mission. So I wanted to mention, in addition to Perseverance, which we'll be talking about for the rest of our show, there's also a plan for China to launch a mission to Mars. Uh, the title of the Chinese mission translate as, translates as Heavenly Questions. And that is an interesting mission that will be both an orbiter and a lander and will have a rover. That's, we don't know when that's going to launch, but it'll be sometime in the next month or so. And the United Arab Emirates has a mission to Mars that uh, is going to be taking off probably next week sometime. So because of that fact that Earth is drawing close to Mars right now, as it does every 26 months, now is a great time to send your missions off to the Red Planet. 
So this is the most uh, ex largest mission that NASA has sent yet to Mars. It's called Perseverance. The title was chosen in a contest. They had thousands of folks suggest possible titles, and the term Perseverance was a title selected. Uh, it was chosen by Alex Mather, I believe his name was, a 13-year-old from uh, Virginia. So we have it here in the clean room prior to its being shipped out for launch based in large part on the design of Curiosity. So the, the instruments on board are quite different, but the overall design is very similar to Curiosity. And this is going to be taking off sometime within the next few weeks. Uh, now, we, if you observe the launch of the SpaceX Crew Dragon to the space station recently, there is an example of having to run a space mission in the time of COVID. And the same is true with Perseverance, where they're having to handle all of this intricate process of loading and launching a mission to Mars in our current crisis. And on board of Perseverance, there's this uh, homage to all the healthcare medical workers who have been involved in the fight against COVID. So there's a physician, physician staff here, and then here we have Earth, and here at Cape Canaveral, the launch of Perseverance heading for the Red Planet. So this one is launching from Cape Canaveral. The last mission to Mars, by the way, InSight, launched from California, the first Mars mission to launch, launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base. So Perseverance has uh, now been encased in its protective shell, a shell from which it won't emerge until it's about seven miles above Mars itself. So here is the lander. You can see the wheels here tucked inside of its protective shell and that will pop off only as it's coming in to land. The launch will be on a Delta rocket, which is the standard launch vehicle they use for Mars missions. So I'm actually showing you the launch of Curiosity here because we haven't launched Perseverance yet. That's coming up in the next couple of weeks. So this is uh, gonna be a mission that will take about eight months. So when you launch when Mars is close, as we're doing with this mission and the other missions that are occurring, the United Arab Emirate mission and the Chinese mission, you can get to Mars in just eight months if you launch at the right time. In fact, if there's any delay in the launch of Perseverance, the launch window is July 30 to August 15. If they can't get off then, they've got to wait 26 months to launch again because of the lineup of Earth and Mars. The landing site is an interesting site called Jezero Crater. It's a former lake bed, a lake about the size of Lake Tahoe was located here when Mars was a wet planet. And it seems like a really good location to explore a former lake bed for signs of elements that might have given rise to ancient life on Mars. Jezero comes from a Slavic word, by the way, meaning lake. And not only is there a lake bed here, but you also have a river, an ancient petrified river flowing into the lake bed. So it seems like a good place to look for either signs of ancient, perhaps microscopic life, or at least the elements. You'd have a lot of blending of different uh, rocks and, and materials if you have a river flowing into a lake from ancient times. So this is the zone. You can see here we have the uh, inflow area of that former river that flowed into Jezero Crater. This is uh, north of the equator on Mars. Uh, they generally tend to go for equatorial landings, easier to land something on Mars if you're heading for the equator. And so whatever the launch, and again, the launch time will be between the 30th. Uh, here's a close-up view, by the way, showing that ancient lake flowing into Jezero Crater. Whatever the launch time, as long as it gets off between the 30th of July and the 15th of August, it will land at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, it'll be uh, winter, on February 18th. So February 18th of next year, 2021, is the landing time, 3 o'clock in the afternoon uh, on the East Coast. And that mission will be, as it goes in, as with Curiosity, there'll be what they call the seven minutes of terror as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory controlling this mission loses contact with the incoming Mars mission. Although Mars is air is thin, it does heat up anything passing through it, so they need to have a shield to guard against the heat as it's coming in. And uh, although Mars does have air, and therefore parachutes do work to slow the landing, 
They'll need a combination of parachutes and jets for a safe landing on the planet Mars. So at this point, as happened with Curiosity, uh, the lander will be out of contact with planet Earth and it'll be a really tense time at Jet Propulsion Laboratory and worldwide until they get word that the craft has landed. The parachutes do come out to slow the lander. You can see the lander tucked under its shell there. There are the wheels there visible. And then the, uh, part, uh, the lander will come free. There'll be a cowl over the lander whose jets will slow the descent of Perseverance towards the surface. So this is a straight shot. There's no orbiting going on in this mission. It goes straight from Earth, boom, right into Mars, and lands immediately, no orbiting of Mars before the landing occurs. That's different from the Chinese mission, which will have a separate orbiter that will then drop a lander onto Mars. And if all goes well, then on the 18th of February, we'll get the word probably about 3.15 in the afternoon, our time, that the lander had come down safely. Now, I hosted an event for the landing of Curiosity in 20, uh, 2012 at my last museum in Hawaii. And at that point, which uh, happened in the evening Hawaii time, we very quickly got pictures within uh, half an hour of the landing. Huge applause from our audience there at, at Bishop Museum, uh, as well as, of course, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So we're hoping that can happen as well. We'll have to see how that goes as the landing time gets closer. So the landing cowl gets out of the way. And so then here we have the device itself on the surface of Mars. So based on the design of Curiosity, but a little more robust with bigger wheels. There are a few wheel jamming problems on Curiosity. And with a way to drill into the actual soil. So Curiosity would kind of bang the soil on Mars and then analyze it. But this mission, Perseverance, will actually have a drill that will go down into the surface and be able to extract a core sample. It will drill out the core sample as you see it doing here and then safely store it on board Perseverance for years and years. And why is that? Because the hope is that a separate mission to Mars will be able to go in a few years, land close to the Perseverance uh, rover and then go and collect these Martian core samples from the lander. Apollo 12, that uh, Apollo mission, landed close to the lunar surveyor and they were able to walk over and visit it. So this may be the next step beyond that, sending another mission, a combined NASA and European Space Agency mission to go and collect these core samples. Now, so it'll be actually analyzing the surface and looking in detail for not only whether Mars had the, the elements needed for life, but whether maybe microscopic life could have got going back in the wetter days of Mars's past. Another item about this mission that's completely different from any past mission is this Ingenuity helicopter. It's only being tested out for this mission, but it is indeed an ingenious device. It's basically a four pound helicopter that will be able to do the scouting for the rover so as the helicopter heads up, it needs big blades and the blades have got to spin fast to get lift in this thin Martian atmosphere. But it will go away from the rover and scout out both regions that would be dangerous to travel to because of, say, big craters, but also be able to kind of figure out what the right places would be to go to for the rover. It takes a long time for the rover to travel. Rovers travel very slowly to be careful. So having a little helicopter will be a great way to scope out the landing zone prior to the rover going and exploring the most interesting regions. So this is something that is uh, going to be functioning in the first 30 days of the mission after it lands in February. So basically scoping out the landscape of Mars and kind of figuring out where to go to send there uh, the rover itself in the wake of the, uh, the helicopter. So it's an ingenious mission, and again, it's coming up very shortly. The launch is going to be between July 30 and the 15th of August, so just over a two-week window. And, the, and then if they can't, for some reason, can't go then through any combination of bad luck, they're going to have to take this whole kit and caboodle and put it into storage for a couple of years and then launch to Mars again 
once uh, the lineup is 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 good again for the uh, the planets, uh, the Earth and, and Mars. So stay tuned to that. Exciting time for Mars. Check out Mars in the morning sky as well. And uh, that is the end of our formal program about what's coming up. I'm going to stay around for a few minutes and check out some of the questions here we have on the feed as well. And you can join us also next week where Andrew is going to talk about dark energy and dark matter. So checking over the comments here. So I don't think we have a wait for Mars, uh, Trishala is wondering, but Mars doesn't have very much mass, right? So the Earth is way, way heavier, if you put it on a scale, than Mars is. So Mars is only 11% of the mass of Earth. So it's a very small and light planet. Kind of surprising how small and light Mars is compared to uh, the planet Earth. So it's often surprises folks that Mars and Venus are almost, are, I mean, Earth and Venus are the same size and Mars is way, way smaller. So yeah, many questions about Martian monsters. As far as we know, uh, there's never been intelligent life on Mars. And who knows, there could have at some point have been microscopic life. Certainly on Earth, wherever we have water on Earth, we have life. And so because Mars was a much, much wetter planet with a thicker atmosphere billions of years ago, there's a good chance that Mars could have gotten life going billions of years ago. Okay, Evelyn, uh, can people live on Mars? Great question. So of all the planets, the only planet there's any chance of going to with a human mission is the red planet Mars. Uh, Mercury is too far away and Venus is an unbearable place where it's always 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Mars is the only planet we have any chance of getting a human mission to in this century. But here's the challenge. Uh, it takes eight months to get to Mars, but also once you're on Mars with a human mission, you're going to want to come home. So you've got to wait on Mars until Mars and Earth line up again, as we talked about earlier. So you've got to be on Mars for well over a year, and then it's eight months back. So by the time you add it all up, you're talking about a two and a half to three year mission to get humans to Mars and back. So it is a high priority for NASA and other agencies to get to Mars but it is far more challenging than going to the moon, which there and back took only two weeks for to go to the moon and back. So that is the challenge there. It is a complicated mission. It is a high priority, but there's a lot of things that have to happen. All of these missions we're sending to Mars in terms of robot missions are aimed in part to pave the way to figure out how we're going to eventually get human beings to the red planet. So the rover itself won't be testing samples, but it'll be scoping out areas. Uh, I mean, the, the helicopter won't be testing samples, but it'll be scoping out good places for the rover to go to, to try to find areas to, 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 to dig down into. Now, in terms of living on Mars, you definitely need a spacesuit, but that's true of any place besides Earth, right? So uh, with the air being thin and it being so cold on Mars, uh, you would definitely need a spacesuit with an oxygen supply to survive out there. And yes, uh, Addy's wondering, is Mars red because of the iron and iron rusted? Yes, basically Mars is red because of the rust. So there's a great deal of iron oxide or rust. And that actually is what uh, colors most of Mars, that ruddy color that for a long time led folks to uh, identify it with warfare. So the manned missions, yeah, human missions, probably talking, they're saying as early as the 2030s but realistically, probably more like the 2040s until we we're able to get a human mission out to the red planet Mars. It is not an easy undertaking. Yeah, so Martian seasons, uh, Bridget's wondering about. So Mars, uh, because it's tilted like Earth is, as it goes around the sun, it does have seasons. However, a Martian year is about two Earth years. So every season is about six months instead of being only three months as it goes around the sun. And of course, Mars already being cold, it gets extremely cold when it becomes wintertime for any given part of Mars. And also the polar caps do expand 
as it becomes winter in the southern hemisphere, the south polar cap expands and then shrinks as you get into summertime for the southern hemisphere, very similar to what happens on Earth. And that was one of the things about Mars, even though it's a hard little target in your telescope, that they were actually able to determine about Mars way back in the 18th and 19th centuries. Mars does have seasons very different from Venus. Venus is straight upright and is only one temperature all the time, 861 degrees Fahrenheit. Mars has great swings in temperature, more so than the Earth even, because there's not as much of a blanket of air uh, and has really dramatic changes in the seasons as we go through uh, the very long seasons on the planet Mars. So again, if folks want to support us, we're going to keep on trying to do this for as long as we can, certainly for the whole time that our planetarium remains closed. There is a donate button there if you want to support us here. Uh, could Mars ever be captured by Jupiter? They're too far away now. Uh, there's a lot of new interesting theories about maybe how Jupiter might have formed, though, in the inner solar system and then found its way out. And so according to that theory, which is a recent one that certainly I wasn't taught when I was going to school, that if Jupiter formed in the same part of the solar system as where Mars formed, that might explain how, why Mars is small. Because Jupiter, as this massive planet, 100,000 miles in diameter, pulled all the material into it and didn't leave much left behind for the little planets like Mars to form. So yeah, we found uh, the question, one question is, any water on Mars? Uh, we have water in the form of ice, definitely. But also, there was a discovery announced just uh, less than two years ago that they have found an under-the-crust lake of liquid water near Mars, Mars' South Pole. So for the first time, they did announce two years ago that there is evidence that there is liquid water, not on Mars, but under the surface of Mars. So who knows, again, wherever life forms, wherever water appears on Earth, we do in fact have uh, life as well. So who knows if there might be some Martian fish still in that lake to this very, very day. What would Mars, what would Earth look like from Mars? Mars would be a very, uh, the Earth from Mars, the Earth from Mars would be a very bright, kind of pale blue dot. Brighter than Mars is from Earth because Earth is a much bigger planet and is also closer to the sun, so it gets more sunlight to reflect. Yes, Mars is, uh, has the biggest volcanoes. Mount Olympus is uh, about 13 miles high. So back in the crazy youth of Mars, you had erupting volcanoes all over the planet, giant eruptions, and also great volcanic activity and water. So Mars was really a lively place million, uh, billions of years ago, far more so than it is now. Uh, Calum is wondering what is the hottest temperature ever recorded on Mars. It's gotten as hot, hot as uh, 68 degrees on Mars. So it actually has gotten about as warm as an average spring day in Seattle, as we used to say at Pacific Science Center. But that is uh, very unusual. More often than not, Mars is well below zero Fahrenheit. Uh, so someone is asking, can people live on Europa? So Europa is a moon of uh, Jupiter's that we're almost 100% certain has an under the crust ocean. There again, you'd have to have a very protective spacesuit and oxygen supply to survive on any place beyond planet Earth. The problem with Europa and any other place beyond Mars is that just getting to Jupiter and its moons would take two to three years each direction and so if you remember the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, they had to put the astronauts in suspended animation because the journey from Earth to the outer planets would take years, if not decades. Checking out to see if there are any final questions here. We have some. So the uh, one question about why the helicopter is working for 30 days, that's the planned amount of time to test it out. Uh, quite often, NASA will announce that a mission will run for a year, and then the mission will wind up running for 10 years. So I think there's some hope of maybe getting more life out of this uh, helicopter, but they're planning to have it for 30 days at least to do the testing. It's technology they really want to build upon for future missions to the Red Planet. So I think that's all uh, we have questions for for now. So check out Mars itself. It's coming up now around midnight, but we'll come around to the evening sky as we get into the early fall. 
And then again, if you want to support us, uh, we, uh, the, the donate, donate button is there on the Facebook screen. And then join us again next week when Andrew's going to talk about dark matter and dark energy, another topic that folks are really, really fascinated by in this great and wonderful universe of ours. So thank you again, everybody, and we'll see you, I hope, next week. <laughs>